In this video, we're going to talk about how John Deere won tech but lost farmers, how they're making record profits, but if you look in the news, you see headlines like this. Nothing runs like a deer. You've probably heard this if you grew up around a rural community, but here in 2025, John Deere is more of a data company than it is an equipment company. I was wondering the other day, how did we even get here? My grandfather was one of the first few people to get a tractor back in the 1930s when it was considered new technology. And I don't think he could ever imagine the problems that we're facing today, or even that we've come up with auto steering. And that's kind of the whole point of doing this deep dive. As an ag tech founder and somebody that owns uh, ag tech businesses where the end user is a farmer or a rancher, I wanted to get some key takeaways and lessons from a great company such as John Deere. And I hope you stay tuned as we continue this deep dive. John Deere was founded back in 1837 where it started off making plows and of course, tractors. And I thought it was pretty cool to look up the very first uh, John Deere tractor, which was purchased by another company. The Waterloo Boys, I guess what it's called. And I thought it was really neat to look at. I had a personal attachment with the Model H. This is a later model that John Deere came out with just because my dad collected antique tractors and this is something that he had and we actually did use it for fun on small jobs around uh, the hobby farm that I grew up on. So that's my personal connection here to this company as well. So when did Deere switch from this model starting in 1837 to the current business model? Um, that's a juicy, meaty question, and the short answer is mid-2010s. But I'm going to take it back a step further, and let's go into the 2000s so we can understand how we got here. So by the early 2000s, John Deere is already kind of experimenting with GPS tracking and kind of the beginnings of auto steering as well, but it was still fundamentally a hardware company. So it made money selling the tractors and all the physical stuff. But then the tractors were getting smarter as time went on, and the business model wasn't changing yet. But that shift happened really strongly around like 2011 and 2012, when John Deere launched its John Deere Operations Center. After the successful launch of the John Deere Operations Center, these guys were on a roll. They acquired Blue River Technologies. This was a Silicon Valley startup that basically uh, use machine vision to identify like plant parts and also spray herbicides only where it was needed. Kind of the start of uh, what we call today precision agriculture. And then around 2019 to 2021, we really see the leaps and bounds. They really started to shift and go really heavy on AI. And when I say AI, I mean artificial intelligence. And they acquired stuff like bear flag robotics and really introduced like autonomous tractors rolling out around 2022 era. Fast forward to now, today in 2025, they have over 500 million acres worth of data, which is crazy. Farmers are now paying for like software updates or they're dependent on software updates. And this is where I feel like John Deere starts to feel more like a data company. And this is right when the story starts to get messy. And the question at hand is, who actually owns what? Let's get into the real big controversy, which is the Right to Repair Act. Basically what's going on is that farmers cannot fix their tractors like my grandfather once did. You have to call a technician and the technician must come out. But don't take my word for it. Listen to this farmer testimonial about it right here. It was just randomly shutting down. First thing we did was change the fuel filters in it, and it didn't really resolve the problem. So I was stymied at that point. That's and the only thing that you basically have the ability to do without the John Deere software. That's exactly right. Yep. When a modern John Deere tractor malfunctions, you can't diagnose the problem without John Deere's software. But John Deere won't let farmers or independent mechanics use it. Only an authorized dealership. And I said, all right, we'll send your tech out. Let's get it done. Yeah. And he said, well, but we're pretty busy. Uh, we might be able to do a little faster if you brought it into our shop. And that faster ended up being? A month. In farming, that's called time is of the essence. We have windows of opportunity where we can get our crop planted at the right time. Too early, you might damage the crop. Too late, you might damage the crop. And then on top of that, you've got Mother Nature. If Walter didn't bail his hay quickly, he stood to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. On top of that, the repair wasn't cheap. The part itself was about $150, $160. And the labor to actually change that part was about $300. But my bill was almost 5000 
This is why those repair restrictions exist. Service and repair work can yield John Deere five times more profit than new equipment sales. John Deere's profits grew by 61% in recent years, and their CEO's salary grew by 160%. Was this a, a faulty sensor? It only took them, you know, a couple hours to swap it out. Is that something you could have done yourself? Oh, certainly. Yep, okay. yep. As long as I had the software and the, and the computer to reprogram the, the sensor. So you need the software both to diagnose the problem and then also make the actual part repair. repair. Yep, that's right. That strategy of requiring software to install a new part, it's called parts pairing. And it was invented by Apple, who's been a real leader in the anti-repair space. They also... The company John Deere says it's about safety, it's about cybersecurity and um, visibility. So then that way they can track everything that's been done to your tractor and it's all part of their dealer support package. But... Honest, it's obviously rub people like the wrong way. Um, there's no doubting that factor. Just uh, look up John Deere right to repair act and you're just going to see a bunch of negative takes. So I want to be clear. I have zero evidence that John Deere is taking the data that it's collected and is directly selling it to third parties, but the infrastructure they've made has allowed it for third parties to use this data and use like John Deere's API to then profit off of it. So once again, it just uh, begs the question of what are they doing with all this stuff? And as you know, they they make you sign a terms and conditions and what are they really doing with it? And at the end of the day, even if they aren't selling it directly, there are others that are using this data or getting access to this to these data points and they are profiting off of it. Some other minor controversies that John Deere has faced has been this chief tractor officer social media title thing. Um, I don't think it was a big deal, but a uh, few people were just rubbed the wrong way about it and I kind of get it. Uh, personal opinion, I don't think there's anything wrong that they did or who they selected was a bad choice. I think they just weren't very clear about what they were trying to do, which uh, in this case, they did succeed. They wanted to reach a younger new audience and they definitely um, made that happen. But I guess my question is why? Um, because an everyday person, what are they gonna do with John Deere? It's not like they would buy a tractor, I guess maybe lawn care, but I don't know, I guess, uh, it was a win, but I think they just should have been a little bit more uh, clear about what they were looking for. And then that way people didn't get shocked and we didn't see comments like this all over the place. Actually, that is a good question. Somebody smarter than me, or maybe if you are on the inside, could you let me know like how much does the John Deere like lawn care, like selling to like everyday people, like percentage make up your business? Because um, if it is a lot, then I totally get why they would get like a Gen Z person to try to get younger people to buy like a John Deere lawnmower. I think what fascinates me about this whole John Deere rise and fall situation is that they didn't fall because of their business. Like honestly, they were brilliant, but they fell in public opinion because of how they decide to control and manipulate their customers. I think what was interesting in this case is that perception really does matter with innovation. And I think as an ag tech founder and being in the ag industry, I've learned that it really just comes down to trust people trusting you at the end of the day. And for me, I think John Deere, they crossed that line of controlling and then helping their customers. Like, yes, they had the intention of helping, but in the end they ended up controlling them. Here's my biggest takeaways. Uh, one, I think farmers, they don't want magic. They just want something that will help them and help them do what they love better and make their lives easier. And that's what I strive to do. And two, data should serve the customer, not trap them. And yeah, um, crossing that line between helping them and controlling them is what led to their downfall. And I think number three, and this works for any kind of business. Transparency is a feature. I don't care uh, what industry you're in, but being transparent about pricing and what you actually do with the data is important. Customers do care about that. And I think uh, number four for me is that innovation has to meet the user where they're at. So you need to be creating innovation innovations that serve their current needs, not what you think is going to be best. And I think that really applies in the ag industry. I do agree sometimes you can be innovative and create like a solution that people don't know that they need. But in this day and age, and after all that we've been through, I think it's really important to meet your customers where they're at. 
John Deere's story has taught me a lot about ag tech and, um, and really taught me the lesson that it's not about replacing the farmer or replacing anybody. It's about respecting them and helping them at the end of the day. And I think the companies will remember uh, that it's the farmers or your end customers that matter are the ones that are going to continue to uh, be successful in this industry. I'm Marsha, I'm a farmer agronomist turned software engineer, and I own my own ag tech company and I help other businesses save time and energy through automations. I love creating software for people and I love learning about all things ag science um, topic wise. So I hope you really enjoyed this video and I'd love to catch you in the next one. See you around.